you want to start with that? Yes. Did we do the first yet? We did. Yep. No, that, that's right. All right. Okay, so you weren't going to do it now. Yeah, I didn't know. Uh, at Kristen's request, um, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for Allison Donovan, the girl who was tragically killed in a hit and run uh, in Somerville. Allison's a Burlington native. Her mom, um, Jan Donovan, uh, passed away some years ago. The playground outside the preschool is um, named after Jan Donovan. And Allison was um, just mowed down in a hit and run, and it's a terrible loss to Burlington, to the education community in general. Um, She's a great, great person, and we send our deepest sympathy to her family and friends. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Um, so on the agenda, we'll start with an approval of January 22nd, 2019 minutes. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Abstain. Passes 4 0 0. Uh, approval of the warrant. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Abstain. Ab opposed? Abstain. abstain. So it passes 3 0 1. Is there anyone here for public participation at this point? Okay. Um, next, we have uh, information and reports. Our student representative is not with us tonight. Uh, so are there any subcommittee reports? Um, I don't have a subcommittee sign? report, but I want to take this opportunity. Sometimes we make little announcements. And um, I want to give a real shout out for the art department for the in the Burlington schools. Um, we come in here and this is where I usually get to see the student artwork. They are kind enough to share with us. Sometimes it's in here, sometimes it's in the hallways. And um, last week when I came in for a meeting, I walked down this hallway and I was just grabbed by the art in that hallway um, by Martello Cesar. And I don't know if that's how to pronounce his name, I hope it is, but Martello Cesar is an amazing artist who's getting uh, the training and opportunity to uh, express his artistic uh, abilities. And I just, I don't know what grade he's in, um, but he's amazing. It just, I, I stopped, it caught my breath, I like caught my breath. And I just had to announce that because this individual student is amazing, but I know also that the art programming K to 12 is, is just mm -hmm. amazing in Burlington. And I wanna thank all the teachers and people that are doing it and all the other students who are producing amazing art in our schools and in our town, so. Thank you. Uh, the Ways and Means, anything? Okay, <laughs> thank you <laughs> for coming out tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, next on the agenda is Instruction Technology, the Biliteracy Update. Mr. So Larkin? the, yeah, thank you. The Seal of Biliteracy is something that's um, part of the Look Act and basically, um, Mrs. Dacey at the high school, our foreign language department head, has taken the lead on this. And we will get a, um, we will put out the word to seniors next year sometime um, towards the calendar end of 2019 about um, students that are interested in going for the seal of biliteracy. It'll be another honor at graduation time if, if they achieve this uh, seal. There'll be a test involved basically where um, students can prove their proficiency in uh, multiple languages. So obviously for English, um, we're using the state MCAS test um, mm -hmm. and based on whether they're proficient or advanced, um, we'll have um, one part of the decision and then they will also be tested in the second language. Um, for some of those, we'll use the um, ACTFL tests, I believe they're called. Um, and you may see something in the budget request um, for us to fund that, it's about $17 a student. I think for those uh, tests, depending on which language it's in. Uh, and again, we're not looking at huge numbers. I would say 50 would be high. Um, so again, I, I just think it's a, it'd be a, another great thing for us to promote as a school district that we have this so many students um, graduating with this seal of biliteracy. So we'll have a lot more to say on it next year. Um, the other interesting thing um, right now, the state 
Um, I know we hosted a meeting here this week uh, of a group from the state, um, people around the state who were trying to create a, uh, a pool online of folks that have proficiency in some of the languages that are more difficult to, um, to find someone who's proficient. Like, for instance, in Burlington, Gujarati is one of the, the languages some of our um, Indian students may have. And we, again, there's not a large pool of folks at the state level, so um, they're trying to develop a cohort of folks that can come out and assess students in various languages. So again, it's, it's an exciting time. It's, we're on the um, forefront of this. I'm really happy that Mrs. DC and um, the staff is supporting this and we'll have Again, a lot more detailed next year around December when we start to look at the number of kids that are um, applying for this seal of biliteracy. Ms. Monka? Are you um, talking about students who have um, a different language as their primary language or students who learn a language other than English or both? It's both, yeah. Okay. It's meant, it's meant to, um, again, um, to show that if you're bilingual um, that you know, you've done a lot of extra hard work and how impressive that is. So the state's trying to do both. So if we have students that have come in to Burlington um, with a primary language other than English, um, obviously they're gonna be able to show proficiency in their native language and then um, the fact that they would pass the state test in English um, would give them a, a shot at that seal. And then likewise, our students that are taking Spanish or another language at the high school would also be able to show that. So we're excited about it. And again, we'll have a lot more info next year. And I did wanna, I, I encouraged um, Renee to ask Mr. Sullivan at the high school to put that in his budget because I don't think it's a, a huge expense and I think it's something we wanna highlight. Next under communication, we have the 2018 Community Garden Report. Um, are you okay? Sure. Do you want to um, I, I think you have the report in your package, mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think we want to um, read the whole report. If you, anybody wants to highlight something from it, I did read it myself. Um, I think primarily one of the things we wanted to do is um, thank Jane McInnich, um, am I saying that correctly? I apologize if I'm not. But Jane's been um, on this group for uh, a, a long time and one of the um, founders and along with Peter Coppola have done a lot of work and Jane is actually stepping aside from the community garden group and she's gonna be, um, her place is gonna be taken by Fallon Woodbury. But again, uh, I know Eric and um, we wanted to really thank Jane for all the time and effort she's put in over the years on this project. Um, if people aren't aware, one of the things that impressed me on the report is um, last year they exceeded their goal of how many fresh vegetables they were gonna um, send out to the food pantry. They sent over 1,600 pounds of fresh, fresh vegetables from our community garden. Um, their goal for this year is 2,000 pounds. Um, and again, it, it's an impressive report. If people have a chance to look it over, um, I encourage them to do that. But uh, it, it's been something I know we're proud of on the school side to support that effort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know that Jane was going to be stepping down, but I want to thank her for all of her work over the years and you know, Capella as well. And could you say the name of the new person that's coming on, please? Because I don't see it anywhere. Um, the email I have is that um, Fallon Woodbury will be taking over the role of communicating um, from the community garden group to the Parks and Rec. Okay. Well, thank you for taking that job on, Mr. Mm. Woodbury. Mm. I think it's a her. Yeah. her oh, it's okay. Fallon Howes of Woodbury. All right. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> um, I just want to also appreciate the partnership between the community garden and the school department and the way in which the students at the schools are able to watch from the seed German germination, the soil preparation, the harvesting, composting, all the, the whole from the seed right back to the composting, um, how important it is and just another example of a partnership within the community that our students are really benefiting from. So I appreciate on behalf of the school committee and school department, the science center and their work together with the children. Um, let's see, before we go on, I was remiss in the 
executive session uh, that Dr. Conti is in the superintendent's conference out in California. So he, that's where he is tonight traveling for there right now. And we're um, all jealous. Getting, yeah, jealous and uh, getting some more great information to bring back to work with us on. So um, moving next, we have the Middle School Student Art and Writing Awards, Mr. Laffer. Thank you. Um, this went out on the website and um, on our Facebook page uh, about a week or so back, maybe two weeks now at this point, but we do want to um, read through the list. We'll have high school names to follow, but right now we have the, the middle school names, who students that were recognized in the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, in the area of art, photography, um, we had Sara Ahmed, grade eight, who won a gold key, Navia Garg, who won a gold key, Michaela Giordano, gold key, Courtney Magarelli, Magnarelli, a gold key, Madison Barros, a silver key, Caroline Sierretta, um, a silver key, Catherine Campbell, an honorable mention, um, and then Navia and Courtney also got honorable mentions, so they won multiple awards. Um, in grade seven, we had Alexis Emerson, who um, in the area of writing, these are writing awards now, won a, won a gold key for her um, science fiction work. Uh, Julia Griffin also uh, won a silver key in writing. And then the grade eight writing awards were Anna Johnson, who won a gold key for her poetry. Layla Ahmed, who won a silver key. Jacqueline Brand, who won a silver key. Um, Jacqueline Brand also won an honorable mention um, for her short story. Um, other honorable men mentions were Emma Nadaf, Valerie Kin, Patrick Gray, and Dina Paul, and obviously uh, that's a testament to uh, the work of those students and uh, the support of their teachers at Marshall Simons. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent, thank you. Um, just one other thing under communication, uh, an email had gone out to the parents from the guidance department, and this was the first time I'd seen it. It, it, ha it included a four-year planner, it talked about the, the assembly that all the students attended with regard to course placement and just having been a parent and trying to have those conversations with your children having not a hard evidence or anything in front of you and the I don't knows that keep coming back to you I just want to say it was greatly appreciated and I heard from other parents in the meantime that they really appreciate the packet it was a great resource um, that the different Planners that were in there at least allowed for some conversation that was more, more specific than the well I don't know <laughs> type. So, um, so I just wanted to thank the guidance department for pushing that out to the the parents. Great, and Mr. Adubato also um, had that posted with links um, on the school website and it's on the Facebook page for the district. If if parents for some reason didn't get the other links, mm -hmm. um, they can access those in those spots as well. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing none. Um, moving down to old business. We have the 2019-2020 draft school calendar as a second reading for tonight in the packet. Skip the finance policy. Uh, no, that's B. Well, I couldn't have a different agenda. Yeah, it's A on ours. I don't have that one. Sorry, she gave me this one with the, uh, so it's coming up now. Oh, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> we aren't forgetting. <laughs> um, so draft school calendar, this is the second reading. So is there a discussion, motion? I have a question. Sure. <coughs> uh, Patrick. Whatever happened with the Good Friday thing, um, my I, I don't. I looked at the calendar. It didn't. I didn't. It didn't jump out at me. But my understanding is that um, for many, many, many years predating all of us, um, it's been a paid holiday for some of the unions, and so therefore, in order to change it, we need to negotiate it. So. What's the story for the current calendar that we're looking at? Um, that is a true statement that that would have to be bargained with a couple of the unions because they have Good Friday in their contract. Um, but I think the current draft that we have put out um, does 
uh, have us at school on Good Friday, and then um, based on the feedback we got also to um, come back on the Thursday and Friday um, after New Year's, again, just to come back to, come back to not school, to have not to school. have the full two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the um, feedback um, from discussing with Dr. Conti, what we would like to do as soon as possible is get the, you know, the start date of school, the end date of school locked in, and the school vacations. Yep. We still may have a couple changes uh, to the professional development days, mm -hmm. um, but we want to get, again, the, so people can plan um, ahead for any type of vacations or trips or things like that. We'd like to get the beginning, the end, and um, those vacations set. That's kind of our priority. So as it stands without having had any negotiations yet, we'll have to pay time and a half on that day? I'm going to leave it. I'm going to turn to Bob because I know he's had some, uh, I don't know if they're official, but this is up his alley with those two unions. Right. So we have not had official negotiations yet because right now this is a first reading and tonight's a second reading potential uh, for this calendar. Um, discussions have begun because uh, obviously this message went public that there is a calendar that potential impacts uh, the bargaining units. Uh, so again, there are some options that could be discussed, uh, but until it's actually decided whether or not we approve the calendar, okay. um, we That's really are That's waiting fine. to go to the table to finish. Okay. Ms. Simon? Um, I'm, so the most recent calendar that was sent out in my packet, um, has Good Friday as a school day, but it also has two full weeks for the December break. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's what we're voting on or if we need to amend it and how to mm -hmm. proceed procedurally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's, <coughs> but, and, and I'm saying that because it, uh, what I've heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we did last time say we wanted to get some feedback, that the feedback didn't seem to be a problem with having school on Good Friday for families at least. And, um, but that there was a number of concerns from working families about having two weeks uh, being a long period of time. And so I'm open to changing what I have in front of me, which says it's a two week break. So I'm curious how we're addressing that. I apologize, where would Good Friday be? Um, what would it be if we, April, because so it's not listed yeah, on. Yeah, right, so that April. is the way I, see it, but they also, this one that we have here also has the two week vacation break in December. The one I got in my packet. Okay, yeah, I yes, I see that. So we would amend that, because I think um, right. we all, there, the feedback from uh, mm -hmm. most of the folks was that, that um, for a variety of reasons, they would prefer to have two days earlier in June, and it's tough for families to take those two weeks off if people have to take vacation. Mm -hmm. um, so that was mm -hmm. the feedback we got. Tom will make the motion. If <coughs> I understand the discussion correctly, I would make a motion that we approve the 2019-2020 school calendar as submitted with one um, modification that the um, uh, January 2nd and January 3rd will be uh, school days and not off days as appeared originally in the, the first mm -hmm. calendar draft. Mm -hmm. So it's the 219-220 calendar as presented, um, but adding January 2nd and January 3rd as, as school days. And the only other thing that may change with that, um, the, last the last day would probably be bumped up one day. The 18th and the 25th, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe at the next meeting we could have a new mm -hmm. draft that looks the way it really is. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Further discussion? That was Questions? my question. Um, Good evening. Hello. Yes, Steve. So really quick, we're voting on the calendar. Oh. And oh, the motion on the table is to approve the calendar with the second and the third as school days. And these end days because of that will be moved back. The next meeting we will have the official Mr. Monaco's recommendation? <laughs> well, it was, but uh, evidently <laughs> other people agreed with me. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Madam Chair. School on Good Friday. All right. So all those in favor approving the 2019-2020 calendar? Aye. 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 All those opposed, abstain. 
2500. Next on the agenda, we have the second reading of the financial policy DBJ. Mr. Lachman. I think that so this is not the first discussion of this. No. Yeah. No. So I was going to turn it over to Nicole if that's okay. Uh, so, yeah, this is the, the second reading of it. We had um, a couple of changes um, from suggested by Martha and um, by Mr. Eiler. Um, so what you have before you uh, incorporates uh, some of those suggestions. Um, but we can, I guess, open, open up for discussion okay. if anyone else. <coughs> so this one has been you. modified with the, um, the suggested changes, what we have in front of us? Change statements, we have changes. Okay. So, sorry, I'm just getting through it. If I could answer his question yes. to the chair. Um, the, this version that we received in our packet includes the uh, uh, edits and suggestions I had made, except for uh, one, which I would like to, whenever it's appropriate, uh, re uh, request an amendment and see if people agree. Um, we, it, it's, a, it's in the issue of in the absence of the business manager and um, having an alternate person. And um, this ch version changes that to say that, that the final authorizer would be the financial analyst. And given that it's taken, it took us so long to get someone, they're brand new, I would like to add the finance, will be the financial analyst or the superintendent. I would like to amend what we have here to include that in the sort of, those are sort of for the emergency cases. Um, I'll make the motion to amend it to that. And I'll second it. Okay. And I do want to take a moment and just say that a financial analyst has been hired and will be starting in soon, Yay. Jennifer Gordon. So <laughs> we're very pleased, probably not as pleased as you are. Yes. <laughs> and we look forward to welcoming her at a future school committee meeting. So. Um, and then we had other comments from Mr. Eiler. Do we take care of the motion that's on the table just to oh. clear that up? Just vote on the amendment. The okay. amendment. Yes, thank you. Um, all those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. It's 500 for the amendment. Okay. Good. So next on the policy, we had some requests that Mrs. Monco and Ms. Kasha and Mr. Eiler had discussed. Yeah. Yes. So the way in which 
and I apologize, I wasn't at the last meeting, but the way in which I'm reading this is these are articles or ways and means outside of the school committee's purview versus the versus a transfer of the accommodating account, which we can do without moving forward to another board. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. When we do our, when we do, <coughs> so if I'm reading this right, so if we move, have a vote that allows a revolving account to fund an accommodated account operating budget, no, we can't do it that way. The, the way I'm reading this policy is this has to do with if we need, if the school committee needs to go outside of our purview yeah, and I ask. Don't, I don't think that's the correct way to read the policy. The policy is just stating three ways that a budget gap can be closed, period. It doesn't say outside of school committee funds. The, the ones that are listed here happen to be outside of school committee funds, but, but by precluding the revolving Is that, no. that so I guess I go back because I don't read it as that way so I don't know how do you No. so I guess I had um, two two issues with adding the revolving um, revolving funds as a means to um, I guess close a, a gap and mm -hmm. um, one being that the revolving funds are held separately. They, um, they all have revenues and expenditures for a specific purpose. Um, so I think that it, once we start sort of lumping those all in together, saying that we know we can use them for any purpose, which is not actually correct, um, and it, it just sort of demeans, I guess, the purpose of the revolving funds. Um, and then, of course, there are a couple of funds such as Choice and International where um, sort of you guys have the, the purview to um, to make those calls with, with those funds. Um, but I guess I'm, I'm interpreting it or was um, writing it the way that Kristen is reading it, um, that it wouldn't be outside of, outside of the, um, Committee School committee's board. purview, yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ayasara, I think where you're talking about, um, it says in the event that the accommodated budget is anticipated to be spent in access, and that's where it gives the three funding sources. We have it well, written I'm, for I'm looking at the operating Sorry. budget in particular. Below right, which below. is right. Basically, right beneath. Right after. Okay. Yeah, right after. Yeah. Um, I can I can certainly see both sides of that but I think from a school committee perspective if we have an item that can legitimately be paid for out of a revolving account and we pay for it out of the revolving account I don't think them that we're over budget and I think that what this really refers to is if after all that is settled out if we're over budget then these are the only ways that we can make it up. I do see where you're coming from, but I think I tend to read it as a school committee member more the way Kristen does. Okay, um, I, I'm, o I'm okay if it's not precluding you from using revolving mm -hmm. funds in appropriate ways when you see a, a gap coming up and you think that it can reasonably be, uh, mm -hmm. reasonably be covered with that. That's fine. Well, I'm curious to hear from other members of the committee how they see it they want to yeah. tell me. <laughs> um, I do have a question. So Mr. Powers has been in a lot and has been, I know with other policies, has he looked over this one in particular yet? Uh, no. Okay. We've, we've been a little bit busy at the no, moment. No, no, <laughs> I, I understand that. I know in the past he has looked over some mm -hmm. that crossed our paths. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Do you have, Ms. Simon? 
I, I also see your concern, um, and um, but I also would tend to read it that the transfers, you know, between the different accounts are our responsibility. These revolving accounts, if they're being used for appropriate purposes, which is the only time we would use them, is under the purview, and it's part of our way that we operate the school system. And and I would, I would like to support Nicole's interpretation of it as well. Um, so I would be inclined to leave it as is. And if in the future we find there's a problem, of course, we can always amend. Uh, but I would be inclined to leave it the way it is on that issue. Yes, Mr. Eiler? So I, I'm fine with that interpretation. Okay. I, if, if I could just bring up a few other issues. Sure. Just, mm -hmm. if yes. If I have different time to discuss yes. them Yes, yes, yep. Um, I think based on based on some discussions that were taking place with Mr. Eiler and Nicole between meetings, um, we do have a draft. This is only a draft with the anticipation that it could be a potential first reading for the next mm -hmm. uh, next school committee meeting. Right. So I can pass that out whenever you're ready to look at it. I don't want to take away do multiple mm -hmm. things at the same mm -hmm. time. So let me know when when that's the appropriate time. Okay. Did you used to be a high school okay. teacher? <laughs> so we'll hold off on that for right now and keep our focus on this one. Okay. And uh, so just two others. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so third thing was uh, I had a concern that there was no um, no uh, school policy against having a negative balance in revolving accounts. Now my understanding and, and looking at Mass General Law, it was pre precluded by that. Regardless of, of that, I, I guess what I would say is it's important to define how we feel we are in compliance with the MGL, but how are we defining the balance that yeah. we're comparing to see if it's greater or less than zero? Because right now, the one that's being reported is less than zero, and that mm -hmm. seems wrong. Mm -hmm. So we should define a report where we're saying this number should always be positive. Okay. Mrs. Monco? Uh, Nicole and I had a discussion about this and, and Nicole actually had what I thought was a good idea of asking Powers and Sullivan um, what the general approach is with other communities because clearly the state law does say you can't have a deficit balance so we need to be able to explain and be in compliance so I don't know if you've had a chance to do that um, but I'm sure if you haven't, you will. Yeah, so in, in the policy at the, uh, at the conclusion where the last section where it says spending, um, we had included uh, a paragraph that basically says all spending within the district will adhere to all federal and state laws and regulations uh, governing municipal and school finance to sort of make 
cover all our bases and make sure that we don't have to go back every time and there's a change in law or anything oh. and update mm -hmm. something. Um, so I felt that having a policy that says that we will be in compliance with those um, sort of did without the need to specifically address um, each and every law and regulation governing municipal finance. Um, so I, I'm in agreement with you that I think as a, a policy, it's reasonable to say that we should be in compliance with MDL. So this isn't necessarily per se a policy. It's a question is, A, how are we not in violation of our policy question? <laughs> it mm -hmm. seems like we're violating both our policy and MDL right now. And I'm curious mm -hmm. why we think we are or are in, you know, how are we going to address that? Ms. Bismanco? Um, having the discussion with both um, Nicole and John, I, I find it a reasonable question. And I think we need to get an answer mm -hmm. from, you know, a, an official answer on how it's handled. Because we do often, when we have our monthly statements, we often show a deficit in both sprouts and cafeteria. And if you read the state law, we're not allowed to do that. So I think we need to find out how to handle it from Powers and Sullivan. Okay. Mr. Mr. Murphy? Um, I confess I don't have the state law in front of me, so I don't know the actual language. Um, I would suggest one potential interpretation of it perhaps is it, if it's at the end of every year, is it 24-7 is it during the whole year? I haven't uh, read it. Give Maybe me you half have. a second. I'll give you the exact wording, but it does not say at the end of the fiscal year. Okay. I know. I, okay, and, and taking that as historically, in using the cafeteria account, I mean, there were, there's been plenty of years at the end of the year we're in the negative, we move money in there to, to even it up. So um, perhaps we haven't been doing it properly all along. I, my guess is we're not the only town that has, I know we're not the only town that has that issue with, with cafeteria accounts and maybe with others. Um, I would certainly think <coughs> the the common sense intent of it would be t your suggestion to factor into anticipated, um, which would still, frankly, sometimes put our cafeteria accounts in the negative, but not as much of the negative as it might appear in any given day, uh, because we've wound up in the negative at the end of the fiscal year before. Um, but I think at the very least, and I'd be curious if, if you are talking to Powers and Sullivan, maybe they have an explanation for this or another suggestion, but absent having a, a big balance co consistently in the revolving account to cover the ebbs and flows, which to me goes against the nature of it as well, um, at least uh, modifying our policy in such a way to incorporate the, your suggestion there. So with things like when we know federal grant payments are coming and stuff like that, that should factor into the equation. Um, we're still going to have an issue, frankly, with the cafeteria account because that's just the, the nature of the beast with that. Um, but I'd be curious if, if Powers and Sullivan or somebody in has suggestions about what other towns do or what the, how that should be looked at. Because if we are in violation of the law by having a on any given day, a negative balance in one of these accounts. How do we how do we deal with that? Can I comment on that? Yeah. Uh, so two things. Um, one, when I do provide the monthly financial updates to you guys um, for those two accounts, um, each time I do like uh, footnote, basically that you know the revenue just hasn't 
then receive the reimbursement from the state for school lunch or that the, um, the check for the deductions that paid for um, the Sparks Child Care from payroll just hasn't been well posted to the general ledger yet. Um, so I guess those are, that's one part of it. Um, and then the other part is, um, as Mr. Murphy mentioned, if um, at the end of the year our school lunch account is in the deficit, then we know that we're expecting revenues the following month. Um, I think that we would probably see a finding in our um, audit every year for a deficit balance if, if that wasn't the understanding that the revenues coming in uh, the following the following <coughs> month to cover it would be sufficient. Yeah, but so the and it might be the interpretation of the, the practical interpretation of the Mass General Laws traditionally has been on any given day, if that's not what we're talking about, we just have to stay on top of it and, and, and square it away by the end of the year. I don't know. But if, if even with the footnote, we're still at a negative on whatever day you push the button when the, when the, when the report spits out. And so technically, if, if we want to read the black and white letter of the law, we might be in violation of that law because at that second on that day, we're in a negative. Um, so it might be that the common practice is, or the, or, the, or the common understanding is, your footnotes get factored into the equation so that we're not in violation of the law because we happen to have a negative on that given day because this other revenue was coming in. Um, and if that's the case, I think I'd like to hear that as a confirmation that that is in fact the practical way that this thing is instituted because I think John makes a good point and, and it's, it's, a, it's a question. I would suggest right now, at a minimum, we should add a column on the following report account that shows the actual amount of anticipated revenues so yeah. that we can at least factor that in ourselves and decide how comfortable we feel with the net. So essentially, for the footnote, you want shown more significant. Well, I think we want, it, and I'm trying to recall, does the footnote give an actual number of the anticipated revenues? Uh, so for, say, school lunch, I would, that would probably consist of a lot of work for me because I'd then have to go through and see, you know, how many meals we sold, if um, those meals were free and reduced, um, and then back into, like, the formula for the reimbursement. Um, so. Okay. It, it, ignoring for a moment the fact that it may be a difficult ask, conceptually, I think we need to know effectively the accrued revenues so that we understand to avoid the scenario where at the end of the year right. we somehow end up with a big negative number and we said, well, we had, we could have known this earlier, but we didn't want to figure it out. I would and, think, and I understand it's a pain in the back. I would think it's an easier entry for some federal grant that's coming that hasn't come in yet or thing like that. The, the, the lunch program is a fluid thing and, and we, yeah. we, we, we can come up with a, an average monthly revenue to offset. And, and I'd be perfectly fine with yeah. being an estimate. I, I okay. agree figuring out exactly is ridiculous. Right. If we know that every day we have an average of X meals and we get reimbursed Y okay. dollars per meal, go with the average reimbursement just to show, yeah, it looks like it's going to work out. Because uh, otherwise we, we have no numbers to really support that statement. Mr. Nelson? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Tom was saying. I, I can't imagine that Powers and Sullivan, they look at these things every year, uh, would not have cited us for being in non-compliance if there wasn't some department of ed, uh, maybe an instructional letter or something like that on this particular subject. But I think it's a good idea for us to ask them. They audit cities and towns all over Massachusetts. Ask them what other towns are doing and whether or not uh, it's, a, it's an accepted practice, whether or not there's a, a policy maybe at DESE that says this is okay to do. Because if it's not, we might have to come up with another way of putting a uh, reserve, some type of a reserve in there in order to be in compliance. So I, I, I understand Mr. Eiler's concerns, but uh, it, it would surprise me if there wasn't some advisory or something out there that Powers and Sullivan could answer very quickly uh, because I know a lot of communities use revolving accounts to fund their uh, cafeteria budgets. But uh, I think uh, it's a good discussion. And John, you're right because 15 or 20 years ago, well, I mean, we, all of a sudden we had a three or four hundred thousand dollar deficit in, the, in that account. 
and we don't want to ever see that happen again. And we want to make sure we close it out. So if you could do that, Nicole, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. Um, oh, Mrs. Monaco? Just one last thing. Um, I, I feel like we're always putting things on Nicole. I, I wanted to ask Patrick to make sure that this message gets to Eric and that it's a request that we have an answer at the next school committee meeting for how Powers and Sullivan sees this dilemma. Thank you. And then I have a question. It's, uh, it's the, we have the top five revolving accounts or high risk mm -hmm. being audited currently. When do we expect that they'll be back with a report? Because that might be you know, another opportunity to have that conversation and see if there's a finding. So um, they have been out doing field work for the past two weeks. Um, I, we just have a couple more things to uh, get back to them. Um, it took a, a, a little while this time because we were going over five accounts pretty mm -hmm. thoroughly. Um, so that meant that uh, they had to come out and meet with you know five different mm -hmm. department heads and um, pull five different samples from revenue accounts and um, expenditure accounts. Um, so um, I, I'm sure that they are wrapping things up, but I don't have an anticipated or a draft for, for the report yet. Okay. And I assume this would be something that might be commented on also as they're looking at it. Mr. Isla? Right, and, and, and sort of just uh, one final point. Um, and again, this isn't a policy thing. This just came up in reviewing the policies. Uh, so I, I haven't uh, fully understood the whole student activity, student agency account thing. So Nicole explained it very nicely. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Um, it's my understanding that the And um, again, clarification, are you talking about the six building accounts yeah. that, so do we put, when we set our, let's say FY20 budget, do we set an amount in there no. or, okay, so there's no amount. So the money that comes in from different activities gets deposited, there's a long chain of how this goes. Correct. <laughs> yes. So basically all of the money that are in those, um, the checking account and the savings account, each school has their own checking and own mm -hmm. savings, um, is student funds. So if they collected $5 a kid to go on a field trip, um, that money gets deposited to that school's savings account. Um, and then each time that a check is going to be written from those accounts, mm -hmm. um, a transfer is made from the, s the school's savings account to the checking account in the amount that the check will be written for. Um, so there's no way for those accounts to ever go negative because the bank would just bounce the check. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why, I guess, the whole reason why the monthly financial report sort of started um, was to provide the committee with um, an update of the school's current financial situation um, so that you guys could make policy decisions um, throughout the year that pertain to that. Um, whereas these don't impact um, it or, and you don't have access to, you know, spe to spend any of those funds. <coughs> um, and where we have like a policy that safeguards, you know, any overspending or anything like that within those accounts, um, I just, I don't, <coughs> I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um, Mr. Murphy? 
to move it from the savings to the checking till they go through you mm -hmm. to get that permission so that you monitor that yeah and um, the transfer is made through the the treasurer's office so I don't okay. I don't know that So what I'd like to know is um, a as part of the last discussion on the um, negative balances in the, or in the revolving account is um, what MASVO can help us with because that, that's a resource for us um, where there are school districts all over the state that manage these things and have been managing student activity accounts. And so rather than us putting something in place because we think it up now. I'd be interested in, uh, in having somebody check in with MASBO and find out how do other districts handle it. And I would like, I like your idea, Mr. Eiler, of having reports so we can have oversight, but I, I don't know what the right approach to that is. I don't, you know, so I'd like to ask if we can find out from other sort of school finance experts like MASBO and I know I apologize I had to step out for a minute but for the same issue if we could also find out from ASBO what other school districts do with their cafeteria revolving accounts and with those kinds of things that might have similar negative balances as, as ours do so I that's what I'd like to suggest okay if that already been mentioned I apologize okay. that's okay Mr. Nelson no. oh sorry um, okay. in response to um, query as to are we um, properly overseeing it if we're not getting regular reports legitimate question I guess though from what the way I understand the procedure of that money being spent now before there was ten checkbooks in the school and the teachers had them principals had them and so cl clearly that was not a good way to do it and um, we've centralized it now and I certainly I don't want to go overboard in our oversight because it's important, don't get me wrong, but I don't want Nicole just printing out records and, 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 and reports constantly. Um, and I think f from the way I understand the, the ins and the outs of, of these particular accounts, they all go through Nicole. Am I in my job as one of the overseers, do I have to see every single thing that happens? I don't think so. Uh, I think I just have to be aware of and, and be in a position where I'm made aware if there's a problem. I would rather see perhaps an annual accounting um, to see it coming in and come out. I just, to, to request a, a monthly printout of the, 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 you know, Pine Glen third grade went to the USS Constitution this week and everybody paid their bill and, and, and you know, I, I to me I just, I think that, that part of it's overkill. I have confidence enough in the, in the procedures with, that we put in place in the, in the oversight from central office. I would like to see maybe an annual report just showing what came in, what, just so we know what's, what's going on, but uh, not, not monthly. Uh, in general, Ledger is well beyond the level of detail mm -hmm. I was talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just seeing totals on yeah. a quarterly basis of here's how much yeah. money went in and here's how much yeah. went out, we say it looks like a reasonable amount, that could be the end of it. Yeah, okay. Nelson? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, I have a real concern about overburdening Nicole um, and her team. Uh, hopefully it's growing by one very, is it already grow by one or is it coming we up? Ju we just announced it. Yeah, I know we announced it, but it not, hasn't taken root yet. I'm not here yet. Um, you know, historically I think the school committee looked at these as field trip accounts over the years. And then we, we discovered that at the middle school level there was some money going in there for um, photographs and pictures and there was some significant amounts of money going in for, for that. And that there was a question as to whether or not some of those funds were being used for non-student activities. And I think that's where this oversight issue came up when we, when we learned that some of those funds were probably being used. I think Powers and Sullivan said that. They weren't being used correctly. So now we've got all of the new procedures in place. Hopefully we don't see that happening again. But I, I don't think I could support a monthly, a monthly requirement. But you just said monthly, and I think, John, you said quarterly. Maybe, you know, maybe quarterly or semi-annually we could get an update. But 
So as Tom said, they're all, right now they're all going through uh, Nicole, and there's only six accounts, I believe. There's four elementary, a middle, and a high school account, and they're all going through Nicole and the town treasurer. So I don't see the same level of concern that we had before because we've put the safeguards in place now. And, and Nicole's not going to approve uh, a request for a payment if she thinks it's, it's out of bounds. So um, the small accounts, um, probably borderline school committee issues, really. But um, I think that if we do something, like Tom said, maybe annually, and, and um, if you see anything unusual, Nicole, bring it to our attention. Uh, but I just don't want to overburden uh, her her office any more than we, we already have with the reporting. Sure, I mean, we can talk about, you know, what the right frequency is, but I'm pretty sure it never is the wrong frequency. <laughs> <laughs> no, I disagree, I don't disagree. <laughs> Um, we'll do it more frequently than ever. <laughs> <laughs> when I talked to Nicole about this, um, she said that every, tell me if I've got this right, every month a bank statement goes mm -hmm. to you, the treasurer, and the school. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the monthly bank statements are available, and it might be reasonable, I know you're taking a look at them, it might be reasonable if once a quarter you just say, you know, that you've looked at them and they're, they're all fine or whatever, you know, some kind of a, a quarterly update. Um, I don't think it's too much to ask when it's basically all you're really doing is looking at the balances and the, um, the monthly statements. Um, so that would be my suggestion as a compromise is that we glance at them once a quarter. Mm -hmm. and comment I on that? Uh, another question okay. I think it's kind of, and I don't know if I'm confusing the policies that we voted on but isn't there within that policy a safeguard that at a certain amount then you need two people signing off or is it that policy that the student income policy or was that a different so for the student activity policy um, it's annually there's an internal audit of those um, those accounts performed and then once every three years externally so we bring in like a Powers and Sullivan or Mozelli and Clark um, or another firm um, to, to do that analysis um, but just to I guess elaborate on the, the monthly statements so the the statements come a copy to the, the treasurer's office to my office and to the building principals um, on each statement it has a copy of all of the checks that were written um, and in my office we verify that the transfers um, that were made from the savings account to the checking accounts um, actually verify um, with the statement that those are the same um, mm -hmm. so if there was ever I don't know, something different that the money was spent on or something um, they, they would they would be noticed mm -hmm. so. So, Mr. Murphy? I'm ready to make a motion unless there's additional discussion. Mm -hmm. I thought you might have had some. <laughs> uh, no, I'm good. Uh, I just make a motion that we approve the policy uh, uh, with the amendment that was voted, uh, the Martha's Amendment, um, keeping in mind that some of the discussions we have mm -hmm. And the old distinction between policy and procedures, I think you've made some good points and, and we can certainly incorporate those into the procedures, but the overall policy I think is, is I, in my opinion, is acceptable as amended. And I make that motion. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Any further discussion? Just one, I'd like to rename this the Eiler policy. <laughs> <laughs> He'd rather have the Eiler procedures, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain, passes 5 0 0. All right, thank you again. Our next agenda item is the school building needs discussion. Mr. Larkin sure. and No, I know we've had, um, we've had previous discussions on where we're at in regards to enrollment and building needs, and um, I think we were just trying to clarify with the committee what our what our plans are for the immediate future. And um, I'll turn it over to Bob in a second, but I think our understanding is that um, for the current year, we were gonna put in another proposal for the high school, um, given the time frame, And then at the same time, um, look at 
um, establishing some type of group that may look at uh, you know an elementary plan moving forward because we don't want to lose time on that as well but I'll, I'll turn it over to Bob thank you uh, so again as Patrick mentioned this is a continuation of a previous conversation um, one is we are looking for confirmation that the committee does want to move forward uh, with the high school MSBA project again um, I do want everyone to recognize that we have gone for multiple MSBA projects that have not been approved in the past uh, and that does not mean that the building needs have gone away so while we also consider what happens April 12th is the date for the core application so that would need to be in by then um, and typically we get application answers back around December January um, so in that meantime we've also had previous conversations as to whether or not we'd like to have either subcommittee meetings or additional meetings added to uh, our agendas that addressed whether or not we would look at um, additional funding for projects at the high school uh, whether or not we would look at changing our MSBA focus uh, to another building project within the town um, but again you know uh, tonight really is looking for confirmation on the April 12th date as to whether or not to move forward and proceed with an MSBA application for the high school and second would be to uh, have conversation about potential meetings for future discussions Mr. Murphy um, have we already voted did we already vote the the MSB the statement of interest for the high school for this year we, we haven't done that yet no. okay is that what you want us to do um, I, I would to answer Bob's um, or the question that he threw out there I would be in favor of moving forward with that frankly because we're not in a position to put an alternative up right now so we might as well put that in and no harm no foul um, but I would advise that we aggressively move forward with some sort of whatever method we're going to use to look at this, whether it's a subcommittee, whether it's a, some kind of a, a committee that we put together with other, inclu including other people in the community. Um, I don't want to be sitting here having this discussion next November saying we, we really should start looking at this. I think we've got to start looking at this immediately. Because quite frankly, if we don't get the high school approved this year, and I'm not holding my breath, um, we can't wait any longer to, to, to move on to option B. As we've talked about before, even if this is approved by the, by the state, we're still two years out from planning, planning and then two, a couple another year or two for construction and funding. And so this is not, you know, we approve it in September and we open the doors in, in, in November. This is literally a, a multi-year process and um, so in, in, in our need at the ele elementary level is getting more severe each year um, so my opinion is that we should vote the statement of interest to get it submitted by April 12th for the high school as we've done for the past seven years or so um, but I would suggest um, that we sooner rather than later decide how we're going to handle the discussions as terms of framing an elementary solution getting those discussions going ASAP and coming up with um, an agreed upon plan so that at this time next year we have that plan in place and we can probably put that in as a statement of interest next year because at some point we have to um, stop spitting into the wind on the high school um, and just one other thing as we're having these discussions the needs as Bob says of the high school certainly is aren't going away and we're going to have to start figuring out how we're going to handle that as well we've got a, uh, infrastructure needs here that have to be addressed and if it's not going to be through the MSBA process it's going to have to be through town um, funding mm -hmm. uh, via warrant articles and bonds and things of that nature and that's going to obviously take conversation or keep the, the ways and means have to be part of the conversation as is the town side as we look at the desk schedule going forward. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think I voiced this at one of our prior meetings. Well, one of the concerns I have about submitting another statement of interest is that we're just postponing going forward with warrant articles to get the high school repaired and to get the science labs uh, up, to, up to speed. Um, we've submitted what six or seven of these Bob they've all been they've all been denied 
And if we submit another one on April 12th, my fear is that uh, town meeting members are going to say, well, why don't we wait and see what happens with that? You know, and, and maybe, and you're saying they're not going to make a decision until next December. And now we're another year behind the eight ball with getting the high school um, renovated and, and, and it's a big project. I mean, we might have to, we might have to pare back the project a little bit. Um, but I think we should start talking about a plan B right away. And uh, May might be too early to get warrant articles in because we need to have conversations about how we're going to fund them. But I think we re really need to have a serious discussion with, with, with the town about coming up with the money to fix the high school. Um, I think it was, we were talking $70 million, weren't we, Bob, the last yeah. statement of interest? And it's probably high. And every year we, we delay, it goes up probably 5 or 10 percent with the, the cost of construction and steel and everything else. So I think we, we really, we, we, uh, I'm a little bit concerned about everybody putting the high school on the back burner if we submit another statement of interest. Uh, mm -hmm. Although we might not be in a position to get a real solid one put together before next May, um, I think we need to really put a lot of energy into getting uh, a proposal ready for town meeting as soon as possible. Uh, even if it's just a demonstration uh, at this May town meeting, this is what we need. We don't think we're going to get it funded. I don't think we can come back in September uh, and have a major capital item dealt with at the September town meeting or maybe even January. But we've got to get everybody on board, at least I think, for next, no later than next May. The science labs are going to cost this. The, the renovation to the HVAC system is going to cost this. And this is why we need, and the longer we wait, the, the, the the higher the price tag is going to go. Um, so I, I suppose I could support, we're probably not going to get all of that done between now and May. I, su I suppose I could support submitting it, but I think we need to, at the same time, have a parallel course where we're educating uh, the town about the fact that we've been denied several times. The policy here in the state is really not to support communities like Burlington who take good care of their buildings and want money for renovation. <laughs> They support projects where the, the buildings are falling down from uh, from a lack of maintenance. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that's where we're at. So uh, those are my concerns. Um, I assume, Bob, the scope of this submittal is going to be pretty much the same as the prior ones. Um, we're not adding or taking anything out? Correct. Okay. I think we would try to adopt the wording a little bit to spruce it up a little bit. Yeah. Um, Obviously, no fillers, of course, but we would just try to maybe make it a little bit more appealing. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Those are my concerns. Thank you, Madam. Thanks, Esponso. Uh, so uh, I'd like to suggest, A, that we do vote to um, submit this, and then I'd like to suggest that we set up a subcommittee meeting with the um, selectmen, the, the financial team, whatever, I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but we do have a subcommittee that works with the selectmen mm -hmm. and the financial team, and I think that we should meet with them, uh, possibly even at ways some point have a... Include them. And, oh, yeah, and ways and means are included in everything, aren't they? It's <laughs> automatic. And, uh, yeah, it's automatic. And uh, possibly even have a joint meeting with the selectmen if if we need to at some point but I think we should start the ball rolling as Steve said because it, the time has come and and if we can figure this out with the financial team and decide w what we can do and when we can do it um, that we can move forward on the high school that way regardless of what happens with our new uh, proposal to SBA and then at the same time I think we need to talk to Eric about exactly how we want to define um, the elementary project but that's still we're in the preliminary stages of that and I'm not sure we're going to get all that done at once if the town's paying for the high school they're not going to be looking to have an elementary school at the same time so my suggestion is we do all three. We submit it, we get together with the uh, financial team, and 
we also talked to Eric about how he wants to go about putting together a high, um, an elementary school plan. Ms. Lyman? Um, well, I guess I have um, the same ur feelings of urgency um, about both projects, about both the high school and about the elementary project. Um, and I'm, for the last two months, I've been kicking myself that I didn't say that last year. Let's put in the, build, the high school one more time, but we really need to look at other things. So um, I think I'm hearing a lot of what I'm feeling about needing to move forward with how we're going to get the, the high school project uh, going, because it needs to happen. Um, and I won't repeat all the good suggestions that people had about moving forward with the town and trying to figure out how to make that happen and or, you know, help people understand why we didn't get the money from MSBA or whatever. Um, and I had, I think in the last couple of months, thought that, well, we couldn't figure out what we wanted by April 12th for an elementary project. But I also, um, that was when I was thinking that we might be looking at various configurations of, um, of the elementary schools, whether it was building one big elementary school or having a fifth grade academy or whatever the, and I'm not saying any of those should happen, uh, but I also feel like if, if I had my druthers, I would definitely prefer to keep the four more neighborhood type elementary schools and not look at, you know, I feel like if we can't do that, I would want to look into other configurations. Um, and so if the committee is in agree, I mean, so if the committee were in agreement on that, which we might be able to find out with one sub, you know, one additional meeting kind of conversation, maybe it would be time we could put in an elementary proposal this year um, because even if we got accepted the first year, it takes six years for this project to go through and the elementary program is, project is, is really, I'm feeling a real urgency for that as well. And so the idea of putting in another one for the high school when we really don't think it's gonna happen um, and then people saying, well, let's wait and see and the state's not gonna let us know until next December. And so I'd, I'd kind of be, interested in having a conversation about whether we want to keep our four neighborhood schools because if if we all agreed on that and which I'm not saying we do because I haven't had that conversation with everybody then we might be able to say well we can put in a first round application for that that wouldn't be so hard to, to write up I don't think we have a lot of information from our master plan and then we could excuse me sorry um, go forward with uh, talking with the town about how we can get the high school renovations that are desperately needed because the state doesn't doesn't value the needs we have over enrollment pr pressures in other districts. Um, so what I would suggest is that we not go ahead with a high school submission on April 12th until we have a chance to have a conversation as a committee whether we want to try to reconfigure the elementary schools. So if we need to, if we're gonna reconfigure the elementary schools, I don't think we could make a decision by April 12th. But if we feel like we do wanna keep our four elementary school configuration, then I feel like we probably could put together a submission for this April um, to MSBA for an elementary project. So. I just, every time we've had this conversation, I go home and I think, no, we really just can't wait. You know, we, we can't wait for either project and the e both projects are gonna take a really long time. And the idea of submitting again for the high school just feels like putting both projects off again by another year. So um, just to sum up, if we are gonna go with a four elementary school project, then it may be that we could put in a submission this year for the elementary. If we can't make that decision right away, then yes, I don't think it's possible. But I, I do feel an incredible urgency as I, I heard from other people as well. Um, to, to me, and I haven't gone 
through this process here. Is it possible we have our next meeting, we have a discussion within a month that a true proposal, what is put into that proposal for an elementary school? I mean, how detailed are the specs? Are we looking at building design? What is it that needs to be done within a month? We definitely could have a draft available for discussion using the template provided by MSBA and our previous submissions for uh, an elementary school, obviously using high school and the middle school as well too as reference. Um, we, we could have that available. Um, also, just so the committee is aware, we have six meetings left before the 12th, but we would also have to get onto the selectman's mm -hmm. agenda as well too. So it really would be five meetings. Um, so I don't need a definitive answer today. I think a month pushes us closer to that time. So if there was some previous discussion that had to extend later than that, you know, it just is going to close that window. But we definitely can get to work and put something together for conversations. Uh, I'd strongly recommend at least scheduling a either a subcommittee meeting or, you know, at least tacking on to our next meeting time as well to continue this conversation if we don't have a definitive answer tonight. Um, as opposed to just pushing it out a whole month. Monica? Um, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but I've been through this a few times, and I don't think there is mm -hmm. any chance on earth that we're going to have an elementary proposal for April. So I think that in order to not waste the cycle, we should move forward with the high school. We should begin the discussions about the elementary, and we should most certainly deal with the town on getting the money for um, the high school uh, lined up so that we have it even if we get rejected. But uh, we can't do two projects at the same time. We just can't do it. The town will never be able to fund it and when an elementary project is funded, even though we do get reimbursement, the town has to fund the entire project and then get the reimbursement later. So we're, we're kidding ourselves if we think that we can have two projects at once. We can't. So pick one. Um, I, I think we obviously need the work at the high school and we should try one more time while we work on our backup plan and I think we should be deliberate about what we're doing with the elementary and not rush into it in a matter of a few meetings. That's just my opinion. Um, I agree that we shouldn't rush into it, which is why I hadn't brought this up earlier. But again, if, if we are looking at keeping our four elementary configuration, I feel like there wouldn't be a need for as much, uh, as much conversation to happen. Um, and I do believe that I heard, it must have been from Eric, um, that because we have a model school at Memorial, that he was saying he didn't feel that it would take as long to put a proposal together. Um, so that, and again, if we have those conversations and we're not ready, we don't, we have a proposal for the high school that we could put forward, but we could have, a, you know, at least one go at is it possible for us to put this in this year for the, have our proposal go in this year for the elementary project? So I, I'd still like to see us try to do, have that conversation and make a decision after that conversation as a group. <coughs> just well, just to follow up, um, I have no problem with that. It, it, we don't have to make the call till <coughs> into April. We have a little bit of time to talk about it. Um, I think the elementary conversation might take a little bit longer just because there are other options out there mm -hmm. and I think in good faith we have to at least explore them or mm -hmm. discuss them mm -hmm. uh, one obviously being a larger school because frankly if we if we're going to keep four then we have two buildings we have to fix mm -hmm. or either to replace mm -hmm. or rehab or however we're going to mm -hmm. do it um, so like I said I'm not saying I'm in favor of one option or the other, but I think we have to, in good faith, look at both of them carefully and, and give them consideration because 
there are pros and cons to, to both of them. And there might be other suggestions, fifth grade academy or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's other ways of, 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 of looking at it. So I, I just think that discussion is going to take a lot longer than, than a meeting or two and then be able to throw something together ready for the submission in April. I just, I don't think that's probably going to happen. Now maybe I'm wrong. I think we should definitely start the conversations. Um, my gut is that we're not going to have something in place in time to submit it for April to MSBA. Doesn't mean we can't have the discussions, but I think if we're going to do an MSBA submission this year, it's more likely going to be for the high school. But we're not voting on tonight, so I guess we can kind of continue to talk. You weren't necessarily looking, if we were ready to vote tonight, I assume we'd be okay with it, but you really don't need it tonight. For the high school. For the high school. I, I mean, well, we would only need to vote to notice it. if we are going to submit an application, we would need to vote to approve it to then move on to the selectmen. Right. This would really be if the committee was ready to make a decision. Yeah, for the high school. Right, but I'm saying if the, if the committee was ready to make a decision tonight on the movement is really what I'm looking for. So I don't need an official vote on it, really just need an opinion from everybody whether they want me to proceed in a certain direction or not or continue the conversation. Well, regardless of what option we choose to move forward, it's got to be in time that you can get it to the selectmen and then we can vote mm -hmm. forward yeah. as well. I'd say try getting ready for the high school one. So, I mean, he's already got that in the, in the box. Um, Does he? But well, you got to spruce it up a little bit, I guess, but we've, we've certainly Well, but we've spruced it up already. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, spruce right. it up again. Five times. So, two things here. One is, I think we really, to Tom's point, owe town meeting a larger discussion because I have been hearing for years, get rid of your two schools, build one, and we need to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Even if I feel that's not the right model. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have that, con and I'm speaking for myself just in general, that conversation still needs to be had and that option mm -hmm. still needs to be looked at because it is an idea that many, many people in this town feel is the right way to go. And if we aren't going to go in that way, I don't know, maybe we decide to go that way. There needs to be a very full discussion on that option. So I, I personally don't feel comfortable having that conversation in such a short time and doing the due diligence that I think this town is owed in deciding whether or not we go with four schools or a three school model. Just because for years and uh, years, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been knock down the two schools and make one school. Um, so. Personally, I don't feel comfortable having that quick conversation. The Even if we submit to um, the state on the <coughs> high school, we can still be having that conversation. And even at September town meeting, we put a lot of warrant articles. So let's say there's a warrant article for X amount of dollars for the preliminary design scope sequence and then in December we find out that they've approved it, yes. Now maybe that money then gets put towards the 60-40 split. But I don't think either way we were going to lose time between mm -hmm. that September because we mm -hmm. won't be ready for May to go to town meeting asking mm -hmm. for that first, I don't know what it's called, but that first go ahead with the money. So between September and December, if we are ready at that time, I don't think we'll lose any ground um, if we get denied and then we move that money or the town. It, most importantly, I think the subcommittee or whatever the configuration is needs to start with the selectmen, regardless of what happens tonight, because those conversations, we're looking at an elementary school building, that's going to be hundreds of millions of dollars, not or what. It, but will it be more than 70? Oh, no. Oh, no. Elementary, no. Elementary, no? elementary yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I Dependent mean, upon the configuration that the committee mm -hmm. and or town decide upon. Yeah, so, so. so again, <laughs> we need to have that conversation because we might sit with ways and means, selectmen, town, town um, administrator, 
and they might say, well, if even if you got we we submitted mm -hmm. for April and miraculously in December we're approved, mm -hmm. do we have a hundred million to just mm -hmm. put in our debt schedule and go mm -hmm. through with mm -hmm. that? So I, I understand your frustration. I totally feel it. I feel mm -hmm. like we're going to get crunched, whether it's at the elementary or whether mm -hmm. it's in the, the high school with the boiler mm -hmm. imploding and we're renting boilers or whatever you do in that case. But I do think we can take um, immediate steps and be working towards a September town meeting. Mm -hmm. High school, we need to have that conversation. I don't know who it is with the town people, but I do think we owe, most importantly, a conversation, a, a true detailed conversation for our town with regard to what is is in the best interest for mm -hmm. our educating our students. Mm -hmm. And that might have to be the message. Is it money or is it the best practice of educating our students? So at this point, if we can put on the next agenda, Sharon's not here, but when you watch this, um, <laughs> to continue the um, discussion for the school building needs, um, do we move through Eric? to start setting up or requesting with ways and means and selecting um, beginning discussions I'll because Sharon to create to call a subcommittee because it's Tom and me with two of the selectmen and some of the ways and means members mm -hmm. um, and you know start that discussion elementary school cost high right school in the middle of budget season too we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're and just talking about <laughs> when they can fund it. Though. And we also have capital that's up during budget season. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't think it's, it's being discussed, our capital. Um, and then put on the agenda how we're going to move forward with the configuration discussions. Will mm -hmm. it be a, a full committee? Mm -hmm. Or will it be a subcommittee that, that speaks with administration, speaks with town meeting, but mm -hmm. we do need to have a more detailed, I, I just mm -hmm. feel that as much as you feel the rush. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I do agree with you that we need a full discussion. And so I'm, I'm just, it's so hard to not mm -hmm. move forward on it. And I like the way you're describing how we maybe could, could start moving forward with the um, high school, talking to the town about if, if it doesn't get approved, um, and you know, can begin the, dis the to, to do a full discussion about what the elementary configurations are. And it was probably wishful thinking that we could have a conversation and make a decision, you know, but I think you're right. It needs to include a lot of people's voices to, mm -hmm. for us to hear before we make mm -hmm. that decision. So maybe just put it on our agenda for the next meeting, continue the discussion, um, and you know, sooner rather than later, we'll need a vote to look for people's hear his submission and get, get on the selection scale um, agenda. I was just gonna say, I know the next meeting has elementary school improvement plans and their budget presentations, so I don't know uh, if you wanna consider bumping up the start time for that mm -hmm. or not. It's up to you, or just mm -hmm. throwing it out there. I know it's a full agenda anyway. Uh, for the next meeting because we're starting budget presentations mm -hmm. and school improvement plans. So. Um, I think it's good I'll defer to the chair on that. I, I mean, I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure how much more discussing we need to do or, or really do unless I can't say anything happening between now and our next meeting that will shine more light on what elementary solution we should go forward with. Um, but I would like the superintendent to be here just to mm -hmm. weigh in on it. And, mm -hmm. <coughs> um, so, uh, I mean, if you if you think we're overburdened in the next agenda, you want to put a two out, that's fine. Those will give you a lot of time to do it. But mm -hmm. I don't think we're, I, I'm not looking to have a, an in-depth discussion on the elementary solution. I think we should do some discussion on which statement of interest we want to put forward. Um, and we can start to put some parameters in place for having the elementary discussion mm -hmm. right. in what form and that type of thing. And in the meantime, Sharon can speak to yeah, the powers that be. Line up a meeting. Yeah. Sharon, if you're watching, <laughs> could you please set up a subcommittee? I hope you're not watching. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kuna. Thanks. I, I just want some clarification as well, too. I, mm -hmm. Mr. Nelson, I think I may have heard you uh, request that we potentially put um, renovations to the science labs. 
uh, into this year's warrant articles, or is that really just a comment, or or is that? I'm sorry. No, I think that's that's what I'd like to see. Because um, I think our initial Probably. estimates for those um, were kind of well above the guidelines presented for most warrant article conversations, but. I mean, again, if that's not the conversation that we should have either with, you know, this committee and or uh, the selectmen and the town's financial teams, then sure, I'd... I think, Bob, the science labs were part of the <coughs> 70, weren't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The biggest part. Well, I don't we're, remember. We're only allotted roughly a million dollars for warrant articles. I think yeah. that's what I'm saying. Right. Those are going to cost a lot more than that. Right. No, it's going to have to be a bonding discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we need to start that discussion okay. with all set here now. Uh, Sharon you. just texted me. I am oh. watching. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Uh, we appreciate it. I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> Sharon, I borrowed Eric's glasses because I forgot mine. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there any other old business? I'm seeing none new business. We have out of state travel approval. Yes, we have a uh, request that science coach Sean Musselman be permitted to participate in a planning committee meeting for the NSTA 2020 and professional learning at the NSTA National Conference in St. Louis on April 11th and 12th. There's no fiscal implications. NSTA organization is paying for his registration in hotels and Mr. Musselman is paying for the flight personally. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain, passes 5-0-0. Now that I know she's lying. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, next on the agenda, we have um, draft accommodations for religious observance policy regulations implementations. Uh, we're looking at a first reading or thereof. Um, Simon, so I think, Mr. I think, yep. I think uh, the background on this was with our move to the religious neutral calendar for 2019-2020. Um, we were, again, which has uh, become a more common occurrence across the state for school districts. Um, and some frustration that I'm aware of, both as a former principal and now in central office, with um, some of these um, religious holidays negatively impacting students with assignments and so forth that we um, look to propose a, uh, a new policy in this area. So again, I think it is the reason it's coming up right now is because of the discussion of the change from Good Friday. I think that was the impetus to uh, have this policy discussion at the same time. Mr. Murphy. Um, I've looked at I looked at the uh, proposed policy over in the um, the uh, procedures, the accommodations, regulations that go go with it, and I might be the only one saying this, but I <coughs> I'm frankly I'm just not comfortable with it. I. I Starts, it, it, it's, I agree with the underlying intent or, the, or the, the purpose, if you will. Well, we start listing significant um, major, I guess we call them major, non-national religious holidays. And, you know, there's, I think there's seven or eight of them listed there. I... A, I don't feel like I, I'm the person to decide what's a major religious holiday and what isn't. There's a lot of different religions out there. Uh, some people are more religious than others. Um, and whenever you, uh, you know, you use the term slippery slope, when you start listing things, um, you could list 10 of them, somebody's gonna want an 11th. You list 11, somebody's gonna want a 12th. And it just, to me, you go start going down that road, and pretty soon we've got a 180-day school year, and 178 of them have major religious holidays that's attached to one of the others. And, and obviously that's hyperbole, but the, the, the point is, I just I'm not comfortable with designating major holidays and then attaching a whole host of or a whole list of 
cans and can not do's um, associated with those. Then further on, this says individual accommodations for students who observe other religious holidays. It opens the door for other people to say, well, it's not a major one, but I really like it, so I would, you know. And it, it's, uh, it just seems to be, it has the potential, and to me, reasonably likely potential, of becoming a very burdensome, cumbersome, difficult policy to implement and to control. Um, like I said, I have no problem with the underlying aspect of if, if there's a, a religious holiday that a parent feels their child should not attend school in observance of that or that you don't want that, that, that child um, punished for it or, or, or miss an assignment and have a mark against them or whatever. I, I, I understand all that. And I, I just think you know, to a certain degree, common sense and um, comes into play in, in trying to deal with that situation. Parents ultimately have the have the choice of whether they want to send their child to school or not on something like that. And, and um, but I, I j I'm just not comfortable with with the whole policy, frankly. Uh, both the naming and, and identifying what's a major religious holiday and what isn't. Um, and all of the things you can't do a day before, or a day after, or the day of. I, I, I could just see a teacher sitting down at the beginning of the year saying, oh my God, you know, if we're gonna have a quiz that day, but I don't know, is there a religious holiday near the day before, or the day after? I, I just think it's too cumbersome. I'm, I'm willing to listen to proponents and other, uh, other people's feelings, and like I said, I might be the only one that feels this way, but I just don't, I'm not sure it's a, it's a policy that we need, and I think it's a, a, a good intention that's going to turn into a, a mess of a thing to try to implement and, and enforce. So that's my first review. And um, I apologize because I had spoken with Martha. I had very similar feelings with regard to the second part of as a teacher, and the IMDAR was going to be taken off too. But Which one? Um, the second the part where it has all the um, individuals can and can't that you this referenced to. So the first yes. two pages yep. are IMD, um, IMDA, IMDA uh -huh. and that's what was intended to be the policy. The rest okay. is an implementation mm -hmm. that the administration would do as, you know, as they felt was needed. But I hear what you're saying. But on and, 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 and thank you, because that yeah. makes yeah. me feel a little yeah, bit better. I, yeah, but it was I put in as if we were going to vote on both. Okay, but the um, but still with the with the actual mm -hmm. policy, mm -hmm. we're still listing major holidays, and we're still in section two, individual mm -hmm. accommodations for students who observe other than religious ho other religious holidays. So now it's major and minor, I guess. Um, and I I just think it's. I don't like to go there. I like to be, I'm, I, and, you know, I probably have a lot of my family included mad at me for, I think we should go to school on Good Friday. I don't think there should be religious holidays, regardless of your religion, in a public school system. I just don't think, it, 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 you just can't go there because once you make one exception, there's a hundred exceptions that are waiting to come through the door. Um, I, I, so, <coughs> I'm, I'm glad that the second part is not part of this, mm -hmm. but I, I still have the same concern with the with the with the policy because that language is still in the policy, um, and I ju I'm just not comfortable with it. So, like I said, it's a first reading, and, and mm -hmm. I'm curious uh, other people's th thoughts on it. And I can always be convinced, but I'm I just don't I just don't think it's a, a necessary policy. I think it's going to cause more harm, and there's going to be unintended consequences to it that um, we're gonna regret down the road. So if I could just um, review the, the way I see this policy is it has three major parts. And the first part is regarding the major non-national religious holidays that, in other words, Christmas is a national holiday mm -hmm. or it would be included on this. But we never have school on Christmas, okay? Right. And um, so there's that section and then the next section is the individual accommodations for students who observe other religious holidays. That section is actually what our informal policy has been. 
for students who do, who do not observe the mainstream religious observances, like Jewish families, like mine. Um, and that's the way it's been for a number of years. It's informal. The superintendent is really good about reminding teachers and principals have been reminding. Right. If I'm I could finish. I, I'm, act I'm I actually, could I'm sorry, but I just want to say I, I like that language. And I, I, I'm, oh, I'm I thought okay. you said you didn't like the individual. Well, I just, I think it, it, when I read it in conjunction with what's the major ones, it look, to me, that's uh, maybe it, it's, a, it's a, a broader, yes. more common sense right. approach. So if it, I could finish I, okay. explaining. Um, and I'll come back to that part. And mm -hmm. then the third part is that the parents and the families are responsible to call school and say, my child will be out for this reason and they're gonna you know, be excused. And, you know, and then I also, in that section, is that students who are uh, missing school for uh, a, a religious or ethnic observance would not be penalized. So there's a, a number of areas where students you know, wouldn't win the attendance award or you know, things like that, that they wouldn't be penalized because they were observing something that was an important observance in their family. Um, so those are the, the way I see the two-page policy, that those three sections. Um, and if we could go back to the individual accommodations, um, that is what's been done informally in the schools. And yet, since before I lived in Burlington 25 years, there's been a problem every year. There have been families, um, who have felt that their students couldn't miss because there was a test, or a, even a child who chose to go to school because they didn't want the stress of having to make it up. Um, and there um, are families who, um, what was the other? Uh, sometimes it's that the student takes the observance and comes back and the teacher says, no, you have to do it today, or you have to do it this, and so, this is worded that teachers should work in a proactive and sensitive manner with students. Now, most teachers do that in the informal without official policy, and obviously that's the way to go, and most teachers do it, and I don't wanna slam teachers in Burlington, but every year there's somebody, sometimes it's because they forget. I think there was a brand new teacher who forgot one year, you know, and, and teachers have so much on their plates, so I have, I have similar, con I have equal concerns for what teachers have to manage. Um, and yes, this is having to manage a little bit more in terms of scheduling and, and adjusting for kids who are absent, although the individual accommodation section is what teachers would do when students are absent excused as well for a sickness or whatever. Um, however, um, it, You know, the, the, the major and the minor, you know, who is to decide? Um, and I think that the, there is wording that if it's appropriate to change those dates, they could be changed. Um, I, it, the dates we have listed here, which people wouldn't necessarily see, are the two days of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the first day of Passover, uh, the two Eids, we have Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Aqsa, and Good Friday, and um, I have spent my time on the school committee for four years talking with people in the Indian American community and trying to get a feel for what might be an equivalent Hindu holiday and I have not yet found one because of the people observe things differently in different families and in different religions um, but there's the opportunity to add something if it is important and um, for example there's there's the three high holy days in in the Jewish holiday and there are also minor holidays that Orthodox Jews do observe. And so Jewish students who observe Shavuot and Simchat Torah and Sukkot and several other holidays, there's a seven or eight, I don't know, Diane, if you know how many, um, those are not being listed because they are not the major holidays. But those students would still be entitled to have those days with the individual accommodations. Um, because if we had, as you said, if we had every religious holiday for every family in Burlington, it, you know, it would be hard to have any instruction going on. Similarly with the Catholic holidays, you know, Good Friday is only one of the other holidays, but it, 
it appears to me to have been the major one. Maybe it's not any more major than the, I don't know, Feast of the Assumption, or I don't know what they all are, and there's a number of them, but if there is a Catholic student who needs to take the day off for Good Friday or for any of those other saints' days, then they would be entitled to the same individual accommodations. Um, but because having it as an informal policy, I, I've had families who've talked to me about it and myself as well. Um, my own family struggled with this, it, living in Burlington. Um, it's the kind of thing where maybe we would have liked to have seen all the families come and present to the school committee and then we could have come up with a response to their things. But in fact, families who come from minority groups in this town have some fear about backlash. Oh, if I bring that up, then somebody's gonna, might do something. And there's evidence that that happens in Burlington. Um, there have been conversations, for example, the interfaith clergy was going to address a concern about the creche at the town hall. Um, and one of the ministers in town sent a letter out, and this was a number of years ago, and he got death threats. So, you know, I don't wanna over exaggerate, but the fact is that the informal policy isn't working for the families in Burlington who observe other holidays and observances that are not recognized on the national holidays. And so recognizing them, the reason why is recognizing those means that those families and those children don't have to decide, well, am I gonna miss this or not? Do I want to pull my kid out or not? I mean, yes, they still have to decide. Um, but it, it's something that if you haven't experienced it, it's hard to imagine that that would be happening because most of the teachers, it's not an issue. Um, so that's why I'm in support of this policy. Um, and I'm also, I mean, this is a first reading. I, I'm interested in, I mean, Kristen and I had a conversation about it. She raised some concerns that, I, you know, I felt we're, you know, under, agree, we agreed on some things and y your concerns about how many holidays, you know, I understand that as a former teacher, you know, but, and especially in the, the high, Jewish high holidays are often right at the beginning of school. It's very hard to, to schedule around those. And yet our teachers, that's, our teachers do schedule around things. They schedule around assemblies and they schedule around Fridays and they, you know, what am I gonna teach on each day of this week is something that gets planned in the curriculum. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily need to say everything and I wanna hear from other people. Um, I mean, I wanna let other people speak, but I do feel very strongly that there are a number of families in town um, and including that, and I've given examples from the Jewish perspective, but we have probably a lot more Hindus and a lot more Muslims in town than we do Jewish children. Um, and many of those families may be immigrant families who don't know that in this country we have, are entitled uh, by law to observe our, our holidays without a pen penalty, um, to have children miss school for an observance that is done with the family or maybe late at night. Um, and I am hoping that this list includes everything, but it also has a sentence somewhere that if there's a need to change those dates, we can. I mean, if all the Catholic families feel there doesn't need to be any special uh, no tests on Good Friday, it, that one doesn't have to be in there, for example. So it, it's a place to start also and to, to take, to make this, I, I'd like to see us have some kind of official policy because in the past when it's been informal, it, it hasn't worked for every family. Just in, in, in response, and mm -hmm. I appreciate every everything you said, Martha. And like I said, I I sympathize and I understand the underlying purpose behind mm -hmm. this. I'm looking at it more from a practical matter, and, and, and you know, you mentioned there are other religions that aren't even listed here yet, mm -hmm. and, and if, if they all have three or four holidays or whatever, and I, I, I mean, I. I, I far from an expert on that, so I, I, and I don't pretend to be. I'm just concerned from a practical matter to, to, to name specific holidays in our policy 
which could be expanded exponentially as different mm -hmm. holidays and different religions come into play. I just think it becomes a very cumbersome and difficult policy. And I understand what you're saying, that the, the general one that we have now works most of the time, but not all the time. I would rather focus on making sure it works all of the time in emphasizing it um, than trying to create uh, something that, in my opinion, is going to sink itself. Um, that the language in that individual accommodations, you know, take out the word religious, I mean other, and just say for religious holidays, take out not mentioned above, mm -hmm. religious holidays, teachers should work in a proactive, you know, mm -hmm. right through the end of it. And I think it's, it's up to us as a, as a school committee and, and a school administration to make sure the teachers are aware that that is our intent and that's our, our desire and, and we would expect them to, to implement that. Um, I would be more comfortable with, with emphasizing and re reaffirming that than creating something that I feel is just going to be too, too cumbersome. And I, I just want to make sure you understand that I don't disagree with what you're trying to accomplish and, and mm -hmm. I, uh, anybody who has a religious belief that wants to act in accordance with it, I, I, that's, that's their right. I, I, I don't mean to demean that. I'm just looking at it from a practical standpoint of a public school system and I just think, um, you know, we've only got X amount of days per year to do what we have to do and, and we're just creating a possibility here that a good chunk of those days are going to have to be um, worked around and, and I just don't think that's practical. I don't think it's fair to the teaching staff. It's not fair to all of the students and um, I would rather focus on implementing the language that we have now. Okay, Mrs. Vonko? Uh, <clears throat> I don't support this policy either for the same reasons. I, I could not support having a list of holidays for the same reasons that it will get added to. I do think that it's um, our responsibility to make sure that the people who work for us, the superintendent, assistant superintendent, et cetera, that they make it very clear to all of the teaching staff what the state law says. And I'm gonna read the portion of it mm -hmm. that you included. And, and personally, if there is a policy at all, and I would be willing to have this as the policy, um, what it says is any student in an educational or vocational training institution mm -hmm. who is unable because of his religious beliefs to attend classes or to participate in any examination study or work re requirement on a particular day shall be excused from any such examination or study or work requirement and shall be provided with an opportunity to make up such examination study or work requirement which he may or she have missed because of such absence on any particular day. No adverse or prejudicial effect shall result to any student because of his availing himself of the provisions of this section. <coughs> now, I think that would be a good policy. It, it's the state law. I think a copy could be given to every teacher. <coughs> An explanation it could be a, as part of staff development. Um, <coughs> and I think What's really important is that what I just read to you applies to every religion, no matter what. So <coughs> everybody's covered, and I just don't, I don't see <coughs> the need for this truly cumbersome policy with all sorts of detail, and and the list. Um, I, I don't, I don't support the list because. I mean, I personally could could give you five five uh, Christian things to add on, but I, I don't want to. I don't want them on a list. You know, we don't need special treatment that way. If if I or some parent wants to keep their child home on Holy Thursday or Good Friday or All Saints Day, go for it. You're you're entitled to it <coughs> under the um, 
under the state law, so it's okay. We don't need a policy that, that details it. And I do have one other objection to this policy in that I don't recall this committee asking for it. And generally the procedure when you wanna do a policy is you mention it at the committee level and you see if the committee's receptive to a policy or at least you put a proposal on, not a first reading. So um, I just wanted to make that point clear that I think in the future it's very important that we discuss whether or not we want to entertain a policy before we actually have it put in front of us. Yeah, I'll, I'll apologize for Eric and I on that. We had, again, decided with the discussion of the school calendar that we had seen uh, a similar policy in another community and it was worth discussing, so that would be our, our mistake. Apology accepted. Um, I, I just have one question, Pat. Do we have the state policy? Have we adopted the state policy? Do we have the state policy? And Sharon told me that there wasn't one. I mean, Wait, I thought the state law. The state law is the state law. I mean, I don't think okay. we have an option of adopting it, but it okay. might be nice yeah. to, uh, to put it as part of our policy officially to cement that. Okay, I'm sorry, I was confused. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Nelson? Yeah, just a couple of comments. It's, you know, as Patrick just said, there's a state law out there that prohibits uh, discrimination against students because of their religious belief, and I, I suppose we don't have to adopt a policy if it is the law. We have to, we're supposed to comply with it, but it's a, it's a good idea sometimes to have uh, policies that make people aware of what the state law is, because they might not know. Um, I always have a concern as a school committee member about overburdening classroom teachers. Uh, I think we've, we've been piling things on the classroom teachers year after year after year and uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Murphy and Mrs. Monaco that uh, having a list and putting the responsibility uh, to some extent on teachers to custom design homework assignments and makeup assignments and tests and everything else, it, it's just a tremendous responsibility. I don't know if the teachers union has ever weighed in on this subject um, and, and whether they've even seen the policy, but I certainly wouldn't want to vote on a policy without some input. Uh, from teachers, uh, I did hear tonight that the implementing regulations are going to be withdrawn from mm -hmm. the policy language, which I think is a good thing, uh, because there were dozens of requirements on, on one of the pages mm -hmm. for teachers, coaches, and advisors as to what they needed to do. Um, I've been on the committee a long time. I haven't heard the same level I, I, of of concern that, uh, that Ms. Simon has heard from people about having problems with teachers accommodating their children if they were out of school for holidays. Um, and one of my concerns is that if we adopt a, a, a policy, we're gonna open up the administration and the committee for complaints for technical violations of the policy. So if we, if we explain to the teachers what the state law requires and we rely on them to uh, implement the, the state law, uh, I think that that's enough myself. Um, I think getting into definitions is difficult. I know uh, over at the um, Marshall, over at the Memorial School, there are, there's such diversity over there. You have children from Africa and you have children from Jamaica and you have children from all over the place. And uh, I think that, um, like Tom said, if you start defining major ones, pretty soon the, the list is gonna be all consuming. So um, those are just my thoughts on it. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Larkin. Um, if I could offer a possible suggestion as well, just to keep moving forward with this issue is um, we do have a district capacity group that did some great work on um, a cultural calendar that we shared with all staff members, again, just to continue to raise awareness of a lot of the holidays that impact our, our students and folks in our community. And um, maybe just discussing this issue, and I, I know teachers are aware, as aware as anybody of 
when there are conflicts with these types of things. Maybe to, um, again, make some suggestions as to how we can uh, better support the state law um, being implemented in our classrooms. If the teachers could come back, maybe with some bulleted highlights within buildings um, or, or across the district, obviously, but how they would see this um, working better. Because, uh, of course, none of us want to slight any students or families. Um, that's the ultimate goal. I think we're on the same page. But I do think this group might bring some, uh, some good help with guidance and to make sure we're consistent with uh, following the state law, at least as a starting point. Uh, I would I would support any suggestions on how to make um, staff aware of the state law and and how to put it you know how to make sure that it's followed and that every child that comes up and says hey I've got an issue I need you know because of a religious holiday um, I completely support that um, I don't think it should be in the form of a policy I really think that the um, language of the law uh, if you want a policy at all, I think it should be the language of the law. Um, and I don't think creating a policy, even if we did create one, um, it's not apt to be read by staff members. These are our policies, and I don't think it takes you a long way towards changing the behavior in, um, in buildings. It, what really matters is teaching the teachers what is expected due to this state law and maybe some of them don't know about it or maybe they don't know exactly what it means although I suspect most of them do and so just to do our due diligence in making sure everyone understands the requirements of the law yes yep mrs. Marcus It's funny because I said I wasn't going to speak tonight. Um, so I, I come at this from two positions. Uh, one, obviously, is growing up as a Jewish child who um, had to explain every fall why she wasn't going to be in school. So I have a great deal of sympathy and, and understanding of what our students are going through when they are not from the, a dominant culture or religion or um, practice. But f my role here right now is really as that of a teacher. While I agree, we don't need a, a lengthy document with, you know, very explicit uh, explanations of how each and everything will be handled. I think it is important that there be some sort of um, consistent understanding across the district as to what this looks like. It doesn't have to be a formal policy, but if my child goes to Fox Hill and your child goes to Pine Glen, and they both take the same holiday off and they're both in the same grade, then it should be handled essentially in the same way. And so I think it's just important not only to inform uh, members who really do, I, I can't imagine a single one of our members not understanding that a student who is out on a religious holiday is excused and it does is considered an excused absence and would be making up that work later. Um, but it is easier for everyone across the board, quite frankly, if we all have a common understanding. So what does that look like? Does that mean that you take that test the day you come back from, um, from Yom Kippur? Well, you just spent the, the previous day fasting and you weren't allowed to read anything, certainly couldn't study. So just understanding that you know it might not be the day a child comes back, that we have some wiggle room there, that we have, have up some buffer. Um, then that we understand um, whether there might be times that things are simply either not assigned or not expected to be um, completed or a situation as to how it is arranged that a student can do a makeup. So um, again, not looking for a, a written down list that makes everything, you know, th that takes away the flexibility of a p teacher working with a student and doing what's best for that student but an understanding of some general rules in terms of how we handle things so that, again, we have consistency and equity across the district. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so at this point, um, 
the input of the board and I might as well give my two cents too. I, I do think there has been some frustration. I have heard from um, people with regard to their children and the Greek or ortho Orthodox Easter. Um, that has been an issue in the past. Um, and, and to Ms. Marcus' point, the equity and consistency. I know at the middle school that even within the teams, the different teams, there has been some difference of homework assignments and things of that nature. So um, I, I do agree and, and hear the frustration of this um, and believe that we need to do a much better job of educating our, our staff. And I also think um, educating the parents too because I don't know if they realize when they call in and they say that it's for a religious holiday that they should be that specific mm -hmm. in the difference between an excused and unexcused absence. Um, I know that took a while for parents to understand with our new uh, sick policy. So again, back to that might be something, the back to school that, that is um, put in the papers that go home to the parents or something of that nature. That's a good so idea. At, the, at this point, I think I'd like to send it back to the administration, the DCP Cultural Council, um, and, and hear what further ideas they might have and bring forth to us to, to hear, to look forward, and, um, and move forward with this, this discussion. And so I know Dr. Conti's not here, okay. but how do you... Uh, I can arrange a meeting. Of, I mean, we have scheduled meetings coming up, but I can um, arrange a meeting of folks to get together and come back with an update to the to the group in regards to um, some of the thoughts uh, about how we can better implement the state law. And I'll leave it up to the committee w to decide whether that needs to be um, a policy as well. Okay. But uh, implementation, whether it's state law or policy, seems to be the problem right now from our end. Okay. And then um, <coughs> moving forward, because we just for back to school for next year, if it's possible to have s those conversations for ready to go for the parents on their end, what they do with, with a religious holiday, how they can move forward with it, and then for the teachers, so when we come back to school, we're all consistent. Yeah, it'd be great, and that'll be part of that discussion with the DCP about ways to make sure that we're mm -hmm. getting um, informed by families and students. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a good way to proceed, to have some discussion with staff and see what kind of input they have. Um, I, um, but I also want to just reiterate that field trips, you know, and yes, we can't have 100 holidays that we can't have field trips on. Open house, we can't have every night that's not available for open house, um, but these are things that all families should have access to. All families should be included in them. And uh, the first day of school um, shouldn't be one of these major holidays. Um, and unless you've lived it, I think it's very hard to really understand what it feels like to not be included in that way. And as an adult, I can handle it. I don't like it. But these are, we're talking about how do we meet the needs of all of our children and make them all feel one of our core values is that everyone should feel that they are respected, that they belong, and that all people are you know, working toward understanding other cultures. And I think our district does an amazing job at, at that most of the time. But I think that people who don't have these other major religious holidays aren't aware of what it feels like. Um, to have to decide whether you're gonna to go to school to take that test so you're not behind doing the makeup test. To understand, you know, the, the, some of the specifics in here are very particular to multiple repeated experiences of our children in this district and in other districts too, but we're concerned with this district. There are other school districts that have many of these holidays off. Um, there aren't enough Jewish kids to have the Jewish holidays off in Burlington. I, I've never thought that. Um, but there are certain major holidays that I think are different from 
I'm not, I wouldn't suggest that we take Sukkot and the other five or seven minor holidays to be included on those days for no homework and no tests and no field trips. And, you know, there are certain things. And it is, it is complicated. It is a burden. But I think that the discussion tonight kind of exaggerated the burden. Um, and I'm interested in seeing what, I, I, I do think it's a good idea to get input from staff um, to see if it feels like it would be, you know, what, what is a good way to move forward with it. And I'm happy to, to wait on this process and not propose when we're going to have a second reading or vote on it or anything, but to, to continue this discussion and, um, you know, to, to do, and to hear what Dr. Conti says, he felt it was important to have this put in place as we change our school calendar uh, approach. Um, so I, I, I do look forward to further conversations about it. And I, I feel good about what people were able to say, you know, what we all were able to express tonight. So. Um, just uh, to Patrick, I guess, as you have the conversation with your, with your group there, <coughs> if, the, if the feeling is we should have a policy of some sort, and just reading through this, the first paragraph under one district policy before you get down to the major, mm -hmm. that just kind of encapsulates the, the state statute. Mm -hmm. So right. that, you know, mm -hmm. the verbiage is there. Mm -hmm. If we put a period after that, that would, that would be a policy. All right, seeing no di further discussion, um, we are going to move the Superintendent Magir goals until next meeting. Uh, and we have FY20 draft budget. As Nicole gets set up for that, is it okay? Oh, I, don't wanna I completely forgot. To well, it's kind of the handling of yep. cash. Just I know this is not even on the agenda, but it's a discussion. Um, Mr. Eiler, thanks for your feedback. I know Nicole, who helped, I don't know who else worked on this, so I don't want to take credit for it. But um, we do have something that we're hoping will be a first reading at the next um, school committee meeting, but we just want to give it to folks ahead of time. Sure. So uh, Sharon gave that to me today, so I want to make sure I pass it out. It doesn't say draft, but draft, I just want to reiterate that. <laughs> Wait, before you hand those out, Patrick, look at the third page. Was that intended to be handed out to everybody? Probably not. Would you <laughs> maybe you remove rip that? Okay, all right. That's just to give you ahead of time. Um, so I know that last year with the new budget format and everything, um, everyone sort of gave their feedback on what they were looking for the, um, to have this year. Um, so this this one sheeter is not all you're getting, I promise. Um, <laughs> I'm just in the process of linking all of the backup to these numbers in one giant PDF so you guys do have access to everything. Um, but I just sort of wanted to give you guys, um, I guess, an overview of where we, where we stand now with all of the requests in. Um, so as you know, our guideline for operating was 3.75%. Um, currently with all of um, all of the requests, requests for new positions, 
Um, we're, we're currently at a 6.01 percent, um, so we're going to be needing to um, make some is that a problem? make some cuts. <laughs> Um, we had in operating alone um, almost 13 um, positions, 12.93, uh, and um, and a, I think a couple of stipends also, um, which will all be detailed and highlighted in the backup. Um, but you're going on dating with so guideline. right now, from um, to meet guideline, we're looking at about 1.27. Mr. Murphy. Thank you. I, I mean, I think we've kind of done it this way the last couple of years anyway. We, we, we start here and we have to wind up there. So we've been through the process before. It doesn't make it any easier, but um, I think we all understand that we have to do it. Typically, at least I kind of look to the administration in terms of prioritizing where the cuts would have to be. Um, and uh, so I assume Bob will, will get some input on that going forward, but um, you know it's a painful process, but it's one that we have to go through. Um, Mr. Nelson, uh, Nicole, is there any? Um, I haven't obviously studied this. Is there any estimate here in terms of savings from retirements? Um, I don't know that we have all that many retirements um, that. We but you didn't build anything yet. in. Did you assume anything in this 6.6 percent? If uh, if there was anyone that we had intent to retire from, I would budget them at a master's 15.3 for a replacement. I mean, sometimes in years past, there'd be a, a guesstimate that 20 teachers are going to retire, and the difference between their salary and somebody else's is going to save us 300 grand. Did you build that into this, or is that something we're going to talk about later on? There are none now. No, so um, basically, anyone. I think we have maybe two intent to retire as, as of right now. So for those two positions yeah, within right. the salaries. So just the actual ones, not the ones that might be coming in. Are in this? Yeah, just just the ones that we we have pretty much confirmed for okay. now. Staff so young they don't retire. Okay. Any other questions? We will be looking at this in more depth. So, mm -hmm. um, yes, Mrs. Bonko. So, Nicole, what's the next step in in presenting? Uh, and I see this is an overview. Mm -hmm. um, and I as I assume that <coughs> we'll be presented with a comparison of the amount budgeted for this current year and for the amount for next year. Yep, we have year-of-year um, -year comparisons, and as well as all of the detail for every position, everyone's salaries. Um, so will we be going through section by section, or you so know, at, at yeah, we have um, at the at the next few meetings we have um, the department scheduled to come before you to present. Um, so I figured that they'd be the best ones to give you. Like their justifications on, you know, additional positions and yeah, other, I, I, other needs. For some reason, I just have this uneasy feeling about the whole budget thing. Like this year, now there's a total freeze on the budget, correct? Yes. And um, I just I feel really squeezed by this budget, and I'm I know that we've got a running list, which I would like to see at the next um, monthly update. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a running list of things we didn't anticipate that we had to spend money on, and now we're looking at a budget overview for next year, and we're already looking at cuts. Um, I just wanted to express my lack of comfort with all of this um, budget constraint. It's very concerning. Ms. Creedon.
so pretty much we didn't make initial cuts or anything. We didn't see anything, I guess, that was drastically unreasonable as requests. Um, so I sort of, I guess, leaving yeah. the decisions um, for discussion with the committee. The pro like yeah, the process was, um, you know, each principal and um, department leader put forward the budget they think they, they thought they need for next year. That all went to Nicole. Um, again, there was no pie in the sky wish list. We tried to make it realistic. Um, and that's what she's presenting right now. I think as each group starts, like elementary, I believe, does their budget next time. Elementary principals, I believe, are on the agenda, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. And I think you'll start to see a detailed, articulated, um, itemized about what they're looking to add. Um, and, and then we'll have to go back as a, again, group with the committee and talk about um, how we're gonna get down to the number. Yeah, so um, before we had met for guidelines, um, I did some analysis of um, even just a simple contract increases um, for current staffing levels, um, which was showing um, a 3.01% increase um, just just for settled contracts without um, any adding back any positions or anything like that. Um, and then adding back um, the positions that we cut from last year was going to be like another 1.2 percent um, so just okay. Diane we had the meeting with um, the financial team and after a lot of negotiating we ended up with a guideline of roughly 3.75 um, what can I say? We tried to get more. One of the things that, that I find frustrating is um, as we develop our programs, and it costs more money as you develop programs, um, and as we have actually increasing enrollments, and that costs more money, and we have needs for all kinds of things. You know, these principals, when they put in their, their requests, it's not for, um, you know, 50 televisions. It's for things that they feel they need. And it's, it's difficult because we just, we're always, feeling, at least speaking for myself, I always feel it's too tight. And I don't feel there's anything I can do about it because unless the committee wanted to go against guidelines and ask town meeting for more money than was agreed by the superintendent in the guidelines meeting, I go, what are we gonna do? We make it fit, but it's tight and it's, it's not real comfortable. Nothing tight is comfortable. Mr. Nelson. Just a quick question. Nicole, we're short some uh, assistant principals. Does this uh, operating budget overview include additional assistant principals? Yes. Um, this includes um, all of the, the requests from those building principals that um, we're wishing to add back assistance. So is that two? Are there two mm -hmm. assistants? I know the middle school um, assistant is in there. Um, I would just have to double. Was Memorial in there as well? I, I don't think that Memorial did submit for it. No. Memorial's not in? No. Just the middle school? I believe so, yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, we'll go through it. 
uh, department by department, right? Mm -hmm. And then we'll ask Diane to find us some more money. <laughs> We do, we do, yeah. and it costs mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. I got a tremble bell. <laughs> Nicole, I was just looking for the budget calendar, and I can't find it. Do you, do you know who we're going to be starting with? Just so we can. Mm, yes. Um, uh, so the next meeting on the 26th, uh, Fox Hill Memorial Pine Glen. And Francis Fleming. Okay, so the next meeting we'll start with the four elementary schools and their budget. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, I see no other discussion on this. Uh, we have uh, any other new business, Mr. Lawson? No, seeing none. Uh, public participation? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I grabbed you. All right, we do have a um, need for executive session to discuss um, approval of minutes and potential litigation. Holding this in open session would have a detrimental effect on the position of the public body. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Mrs. Monco? Aye. Mr. Nelson? Aye. Chair votes aye. We are in executive session. Thank you. We appreciate it.